My name is Sharon Burke, and I'm on the leadership team at New America. I'm also the director of our resource security program. And we have a wonderful lineup for you today of speakers on a great topic. So let's just get started and dig right in. Um, I should say, first of all, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, aloha and mahalo to our friends who are joining us from Hawaii. We have people who are covering a lot of territory with you here today to talk to you. So we're going to talk about COVID-19, climate change, and disaster response across the Pacific. Uh, what's US policy? What should it be? And what it all looks like together. We're going to start this event with a situation report from the Pacific Disaster Center, which is based in Hawaii. I'll tell you more about them in a moment. And then we're going to give you a brief overview of the New America report that, that uh, spawned this event called Uptempo. That'll be Francis Gassert from our team. And then we have a group of experts who are going to get in a conversation on these topics and you'll be able to ask questions and make comments in the chat and i'll introduce all of them to you later as we get to that conversation so first let me just start with a few words about the work that we've been doing in our resource security team this event is part of a two-year research effort to look into natural security or the intersection of natural resources and national security We've been looking at this both in terms of what are the root causes of war and also of stability. We've been looking at land and energy and water, climate change, and biodiversity, and how all of those things create instability or create stability. We've also been working to redefine, in a way, what national security actually means, that it's not just about war fighting and our investments in weapons platforms, it's also about security building. Um, and that's particularly important in a time of great power competition and when we've got global environmental change looming, which I don't think is a secret to anybody now. We weren't specifically throughout the life of this project looking at pandemics. It was certainly part of the, the sort of threat envelope we were looking at. Um, but I don't think it's lost on anyone that the United States has been investing in things like hypersonic missiles and a tiny microbe has just offended our society thoroughly, as thoroughly as a war can. So um, I do want to thank uh, the funders who've been behind this project, which was originally the Skoll Global Threats Fund. And that organization, that funder was founded specifically to look at pandemics um, and climate change and other threats to our security and what it means and how we prepare, prepare for them. So it's a real testament to Jeff Skoll's vision that we have some research and some preparedness we wouldn't have had otherwise today when we really need it. And I wanna thank him and Larry Brilliant and Annie, Annie uh, Maxwell, and of course, Bruce Lowry, who all supported the work that we're gonna to talk to you about today, among other things. So that's our, our backdrop. Um, and now I wanna welcome our first event. I also, by the way, um, as preparation for this event, got a memo from uh, General Abe Abrams, who's the commander at US Forces Korea, among other things, about some of their lessons learned. And we'll, we'll plan to post that on our site so you can all see it later. And uh, maybe we'll bring up some comments that they sent us as well, since they've been right in the eye of it. So now um, I'm really pleased to introduce to you two wonderful people um, from the Pacific Disaster Center which is an applied research center that's managed by the University of Hawaii and partners with uh, a variety of governmental and non-governmental organizations, including a frequent partner for US Indo-Pacific Command out in Hawaii. Uh, the two speakers we're gonna hear from who are gonna give us an overview of the situation in the region are Dr. Joseph Green, who's the acting director for applied science at Pacific Disaster Center. Um, and I should note that in addition to uh, his calculations, it's, uh, his uh, grasp on technology of disaster risk and resilience, he also has a PhD in epidemiology. So he's uh, in a unique position to explain what's happening to us. And then also he's going to bring in Dr. Erin Huey, who's the director of uh, disaster services at PDC. She leads all the global efforts on their risk and disaster services and has been doing that for a long time. So we're lucky to have both of them with us and I'll turn it over to you, Joe. Aloha, everyone. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so what I thought I'd do is start off and give an overview of kind of what's going on with COVID in the region. And I'll go ahead and share my screen now. And we'll get right into our disaster aware application. And what we see here is an overview of the Asia Pacific 
And as of today, so keep in mind, these numbers are changing. Um, they changed this morning uh, twice while I was looking at them. Um, so these, uh, I anticipate they'll change again soon. But right now, there are over 170,000 COVID cases in the Asia Pacific. Um, that's confirmed cases. And this, it sounds low, but uh, this accounts for approximately 7% of the global total that we're seeing right now. What we're seeing as far as trends, we're seeing incidence rates increasing in India, Singapore, and Japan. And what, what I notice as an epidemiologist is the uneven distribution of COVID across the region. So we can see here in Japan, uh, right now we have uh, over 11,000 confirmed cases, uh, 9, 000, over 9,000 of those are active. India, who I mentioned, we're seeing quite the uptick recently in their case count. Um, they have over 20,000 confirmed cases. And in Singapore, uh, we're seeing over 10,000 confirmed cases and their uh, cumulative incidence is uh, quite high given both their population and the number of cases uh, that they're seeing. And moving over, as you see these little blue icons popping up here as well, um, I think this will go really well with what we're talking about. These are all new hazards that are popping up while I'm giving the brief. So I think that kind of sets the stage quite well. Um, for confirmed deaths right now, um, we're seeing the highest number, uh, no surprise, in China. Um, what we've also done on the map is we've had to disaggregate these by province. So you can see the highest uh, both case count and death count within China are in the Hubei province. Uh, we're also seeing a high number of deaths currently in India and Indonesia, who have almost approximately the same death rate, um, 635 as of this morning. So I'll go ahead and move on, sorry. And so as of new cases in the last 24 hours, um, I mentioned we're seeing a really large uptick in both Singapore and in India. Um, we're also seeing kind of a resurgence in Japan with um, 377 newly confirmed cases. Um, and these cases for China, India, Japan, as well as Singapore are what we've heard of as clusters of cases. Um, these are countries, territories that are experiencing clusters either spatially or temporally. Um, they are linked by common exposure, contact tracing. Um, some of the other countries within the AOR or in the region um, are experiencing community spread. Uh, Indonesia is one in particular. They're seeing sustained community spread in that region. So one of the things as an epidemiologist and as a disaster researcher I'm interested in is what's accounting for these differences. And when we first heard about COVID in China and in the region, we wanted to be ahead of the curve. We wanted to see what was actually going on. And one of the things that we did was pull together data that we already had about healthcare capacity in the region. So for example, I can pull up a planning report we put together at the early stages of the outbreak for Singapore. And we can look at its healthcare capacity ranking. And we see that they have you know, over 22 physicians per 10,000. They have 71 nurses and midwives per 10,000. So fairly decent uh, healthcare capacity as far as these things can be measured. When we go back and we look at a country like Japan, we can see that they have an even higher healthcare capacity ranking. So this gives us an initial baseline to start looking at what we're seeing and how we're seeing the differences. Um, why this is important is in the absence of a vaccine, we now have the opportunity to figure out what factors may be contributing to the difference in case counts and deaths from region to region, country to country, and potentially alter behavior and slow the spread. Uh, and we want to do this, if possible, while limiting economic impacts and preserving stability. Uh, so that first pass that we did, we looked at these country planning reports, um, and this was a good starting point for us but it does lack the ability to capture other means of healthcare capacity. So NGOs active in the region, uh, private healthcare. Um, so clearly more than just the existing healthcare capacity is driving the differences. So what we can see from some of the cases, if we go back, um, particularly we look at Singapore, they're seeing a resurgence. So we looked at 
the coping capacity, the healthcare capacity of Singapore, and we look at the coping capacity of Japan. Japan is also seeing a resurgence. And from the information that we've been able to garner, um, the vast majority of the new cases in Singapore um, are among residents of migrant worker dormitories. So these are a vulnerable population that was initially overlooked in the surveillance and the testing of Singapore. So Singapore was kind of the leader in surveillance and testing, and we have this overlooked population that now is accounting for the vast majority of the new cases that we're seeing. Japan, um, there's some uh, debate as to what's going on there, but there is some indication that just enhanced testing and enhanced surveillance is capturing more cases there. So again, the differences in the capacities may partially explain this, but there's more to the story going on there. Um, and as far as Indonesia, Indonesia has seen one of the higher upticks in new cases. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning of my brief, they have sustained community spread. Um, so some of the criticism of the response in Indonesia is that there's not been early enough testing. Uh, there wasn't swift implementation of strict social distancing and travel restrictions. And now we're seeing the results of those decisions. So with that, I'll go ahead and I'll turn it over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Erin Huey, and she can give you a little bit more about what we're doing within the region. Thank you, Erin. So aloha, everyone. Um, I wanted to take you a little bit through some of the things that we're looking at around the region as we also combat um, COVID. As many of you know, the conversations have been, how do we effectively support HADR while also dealing with COVID? And we want to be conscious of several things, right? We want to make sure that, one, the U.S. continues to be a partner of choice. We want to make sure that we are not introducing COVID to areas that have not yet um, experienced it. We don't want to increase vulnerability in these areas, which is going to require a new approach. So what I'm going to show you here is um, a little bit of a look. First, these the countries in Indo-PACOM that are also experiencing the highest level of multi-hazard risk, um, Bangladesh, Philippines, India, you know, Indonesia, all in the top, top five, are also the same countries that are dealing with COVID. So we know that we have a system that is going to continue to be exacerbated. We know that we're going to have resources and assets that are already worn out. And we know we're gonna to need to approach this in a collective and really partner-driven way, using data and information as much as we possibly can. So at least we're in a starting point where we understand this. Um, I do wanna say that a lot of people I, I've heard are, we're hoping we don't have a big event. I can tell you right now, based on the initial data that we can absolutely expect in the time that we're dealing with COVID to have a major disaster in the AOR. This AOR deals with over 50% of all disasters in, in globally. Um, so we will have an event and we do need to effectively prepare. Now, as um, Dr. Green mentioned, as he was briefing, you started to see up in the top right corner of the screen, um, blue icons coming out saying one new hazard, two new hazards. These are the current hazards in real time that we have going on in the AOR. So don't be surprised if a new one pops up while we're here. But you can see we've got active volcanoes, we've got serious drought happening, we've got landslides, we've got fires um, happening in Laos, we've got severe storms. Um, and then most of you, if you were paying attention over the last couple of weeks, also remember that we were de dealing with um, Tropical Cyclone Harold. And Harold was an event that happened while we were dealing with COVID and at a time was a category five storm. So we're talking about a small island nation of Vanuatu being impacted by a very severe storm. So this is not if, it is when um, we're going to have to deal with this. So what PDC was doing and what I think we're going to have to as, as PDC, the international community, and as a nation, we're going to have to do is a better job of collaborating. And that's really what we've focused on in response to Harold. So I just wanna show you a few things here. Um, specifically, we've been working with the UN, UN OCHA and the World Food Program in creating products with remotely sensed and modeled data that will prevent us 
from necessarily having to make decisions with boots on the ground. So one of the first pieces that we did collectively, and you may have seen some of these last year, we actually started this initiative last year, understanding that collectively we need to all be working from the same numbers with the same data and contribute to the larger holistic response in the region. And I think COVID is gonna highlight the need for this to happen. So what we saw with Harold is we combined our data and information to model what the impacted population would be, what is the population living in the worst affected areas, and in that worst affected area, how many significantly vulnerable do we have? And then we were able to very quickly translate that information into how much food, water, shelter, refuse would be required so we could mobilize resources and assets prior to getting boots on the ground. And that was a big consideration in a long discussion. If we have to get individuals on the ground, then it means we're gonna to have to quarantine those individuals. And we're gonna delay response by potentially 14, two weeks, 14 days, two weeks. Not something that we wanna do in a humanitarian crisis because that's going to leave open a space for other donors to come in that might not abide by the same type of regulation. So we have seen China and Russia and Cuba engaging in humanitarian assistance and in some areas filling a gap. So we wanna be mindful of who else is in the space and how do we collectively strengthen the partnerships that we already have. The other piece that I just wanted um, to really highlight is understanding who is in the region, right? Who's already working there? So some of the data and information that we always look at are things like, you know, what NGOs are actively in the system and where are they functioning and specifically what information, what projects are they working on? Also, where's U.S. foreign assistance and what type of assistance is being provided in those areas? Can we strengthen existing programs and can we try and engage our partners in a way that is both helpful and driven um, in this now remote society that we're in, just like we're doing here today in this briefing. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to give you a quick highlight. This is something that we're moving a little bit quicker on than we had anticipated, just because we wanted to make sure that this is available for the coming season. So this is kind of a sneak peek for all of you out there. Um, one of the pieces that, that we wanted to, to show is something that we're calling the event brief. So you, sh you should be able to see on your screen um, a, a event brief and you see information over here on the far right. Here's the event. Really what we're trying to do and click very quickly is what happened, where did it happen, how bad is it, and what do I need to do? And do that all modeled so that we can slim down the time for decision making and make sure that we have the most information. So here's just one instance of the, the information um, that you saw in the other report. We also wanna be able to instantly tell you historically what's happened in that area. So you're gonna see this and it's most important for um, really the Asia Pacific that we're focused on right now, because historically, if they have just been hit by a disaster and they're still recovering on top of that COVID, we know additional assistance is gonna be needed. So how do we augment and strengthen our partners in the region, ASEAN, how do we strengthen our foreign military partners and our, our allies in that area? We're also going to be able to provide you with a quick risk and vulnerability assessment, not just at the country level, but also at a subnational level. So we know specifically if Hurricane is going to come in, um, Dom Ray is one that impacted Vietnam, and they're in a province like uh, Quang Bing or, or Quang Nam that is really vulnerable, what type of assistance do we need to provide? Do we need to focus on medical or do we need to focus on feeding and education? Really try and make sure that the limited resources that the NGOs, the humanitarian community have are extremely focused and tailored to the need on the ground. And then I just wanna show you one last piece. We're also um, bringing in live cameras so that we can have a visual inspection of what's going on and be able to show people in a safe way, especially during uh, tsunamis, what's happening on the shore, how destructive is it? We've used this actually in response to COVID to be able to monitor how well some of these travel restrictions have been in place. 
And then finally, and probably most importantly, the integration of assistance. What are the agencies that are already in that geographic area and being able to select those and then contact them. So very precise, focused information in a way that will support the decision making. And this is nothing new um, for PDC. This is really what we've always been focused on is evidence-based decision making. But we realize right now that the challenges that you know, leadership has and decision makers around the world have in investing and creating projects means they need better data, more accurate information as soon as possible. And I think there's a real understanding right now that 80% of the information is better than no information. So let's go off good science, good data, good information. Um, so right now, um, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you, Sharon, but we're gonna have a busy season ahead of us. We've got a lot of challenges, but we do have a lot of opportunity um, to continue to strengthen those partnerships that we already have in the region. Thank you, Erin. Uh, I appreciate the presentation from both of you. And just for everyone on the on the, the Zoom, we'll be able to include uh, Joe and Erin in our Q&A session. So if you have questions for them, we'll have time. But I'm just going to sneak in a couple of quick questions. Um, well, first of all, I just want to say that, as you know, we, we've been uh, interested in what you're doing all along because it's a really great decision support tool that's integrating quantitative, qualitative information and making it actionable. And uh, we're working with you to, to try to incorporate the longer term trends in as well, which we appreciate. One thing that struck me, though, was uh, in Joe's presentation of, the, of COVID in the region, um, is it doesn't look that bad yet? Is that a yet? And, uh, you know, I, I think particularly in India, that fat, that wonderful um, tile you showed of the demographic uh, outlay, I assume that India, the, the healthcare realities and the resilience are in a very different place. So, I mean, as an epidemiologist, as a disaster professional, um, you know, is this, where's this going in the region? So I, I, I will agree, it is a kind of a not that bad yet scenario. We're kind of holding our breath to wait and see. Um, one of the things that um, I think we were hopeful on the early onset of this was, you know, places like Singapore, uh, Korea, Japan, we're going to kind of lead the way. And Aaron's actually going to share the screen here and show the key demographic for um, India. So you can see their healthcare capacity ranking from the information we have is sub substantially lower than Singapore or even Indonesia. So what we are expecting is to see this get worse, particularly right now in Indonesia and in uh, India, because the measures weren't there in place early on. So uh, as we've all come to know from watching the news and what we've heard anecdotally is you implement them and then there's gonna be a lag uh, following that. So we're gonna see some increase in cases here um, and hopefully Singapore can get a handle on what's going on with the, um, the migrant housing there. But I think to summarize briefly, uh, it's uh, we're waiting and seeing, but not terribly optimistic. Yeah, and I saw a comment from Mike Gramillion that, you know, that uh, not everyone gets counted. And I think you mentioned that for Japan, too, that one reason their numbers are going higher is because they're counting. Yes, and, and that's also a big kind of offline discussion we're having is how accurate are the case counts. Um, there's various means of reporting some countries. There's only one official source for the, for the numbers. Hospitals have to report up and then what happens from there, there's, there's debate. So. We'll, we'll see as this unfolds, but we're not terribly um, hopeful that this will stay uh, quite so low, but we'll see, hopefully. And I think also it's, what's great about the presentation you both did is that, so this is a region that's full of disasters to begin with, lots of natural disasters. Now we've got a pandemic and the question of what the underlying resilience looks like. And it's great that you have all three of those um, uh, going on. So <laughs> I'll let David make that comment himself. Um, all right, so we'll, we're gonna keep you on the line so that uh, if people have questions for you, we'll be able to, to direct, uh, redirect. So don't go anywhere. Um, You're right here. <laughs> now we're gonna turn things over. So Francis Gasser is a fellow with the Resource Security Program at New America, and he also works with Visuality. Uh, 
with us, he's been amplifying our work on data and technology in particular. And previously, he was a really important thought leader at World Resources Institute. So Francis was the big driving force in this in the, our report called Uptempo. And what we wanted to look at was uh, the natural disaster picture um, in the Indo-Pacific region and um, what the trends are over time and what how climate change may change that picture and what are the capacities for dealing with that and how is the U.S. set up to deal with this. So Francis is going to give you an overview of the report, which has a lot of original analysis in it, uh, which he worked on. So take it away, Francis. Uh, great. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, I, do you, uh, folks able to see my screen? Just nod for me, Sharon. Yes, we can yes. see it. Wonderful. Okay. So, um, uh, yeah, as Sharon said, I'm Francis Gassard. I'm a fellow with New America's uh, Resource Security Program. Um, and I'll be talking about our recent report on climate change and disaster risk in the Pacific and what specifically that might mean for U.S. disaster response. Uh, so first a bit of background on the research that we conducted. Uh, we set out to answer how is cha climate change affecting disaster risk. Um, for this we looked at both historical data as well as climate projections. And these were derived from the same set of models that were used by the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, so the map you're seeing on the screen shows hazards across the region over the past 40 years. Uh, tropical cyclones are in purple, earthquakes in orange, and flood-prone areas in blue. Um, second, we looked at how a changing climate um, might mean for demand for U.S. military humanitarian assistance and disaster response missions. I'm going to be primarily talking about the first part. Uh, what did we learn? So it's the biggest disasters that we should be focused on. Disasters are by definition exceptional, but it's the rarest events that cause the vast majority of casualties and the greatest economic disruption. Um, of the hundreds of tropical cyclones, earthquakes, floods, droughts, and other disasters that occurred over the past 30 years in the region, just five events account for over 60% of disaster-related deaths. Um, it's here where preparedness and rapid response have the potential to save the most lives. The smaller disasters still serve as a warning, though, of the risk of the big one. Uh, so, for example, over the past 30 years, disease epidemics such as SARS make only a small blip in the statistics, but now we're in the midst of a global crisis that few of us could have imagined. Um, climate change uh, will have it, the greatest effect at the extremes, and um, indeed there's substantial evidence that this is already happening. So. Uh, if we look at disasters in the region, uh, you, we can divide them into two categories. There's the ones that won't be affected by climate, uh, not so much at least. Um, those might be earthquakes and tsunamis. And then they're the ones that will be affected by climate. Um, and those include tropical cyclones, floods, uh, and droughts. So tropical cyclones account for the majority of disaster impacts after earthquakes and tsunamis. Um, the relationship with climate is pretty simple. The warmer the ocean is, the faster water evaporates, and this fuels larger storms. Warmer air is also able to hold more moisture, and this means that you get bigger clouds, resulting in fewer, more extreme rainfall events. Um, this is already borne out in historical statistics. Uh, so this graph shows that already we see a slight upward trend in the largest of storms. We can also see this relationship appear in the models that we use to track hurricanes. Um, for example, this study by Trenberth et al. at NCAR looks specifically at Hurricane Harvey. Um, Hurricane Harvey caused record flooding in the Houston area in 2017. Um, the left graph shows increase in global ocean heat content over the past few decades. On the right, you see the abnormally warm Gulf of Mexico, which fueled the Category 4 hurricane. Uh, they found in this study that this increase in ocean temperature led to Harvey dumping 15 to 40% more rain on Houston than it would have absent uh, climate change. And I won't talk about all of the data that we went through in this report, but we can see similar uh, upward trends in the frequency and severity of river flooding, of extreme rainfall, and droughts. Um, 
It's not all bad news though. So while the frequency and magnitude of climate related hazards is increasing, uh, countries are becoming less vulnerable. Most directly, uh, this is improvements in disaster planning and infrastructure. Things like early warning systems, um, uh, flood protection measures. But there's also a strong relationship between disaster vulnerability and core development indicators. So chronic poverty leaves people with few options to evacuate, absorb, or recover from disasters. Um, robust infrastructure can reduce the risk of follow-on hazards, uh, such as waterborne disease outbreaks. Corruption affects the effectiveness of disaster response. Um, this data you're seeing is from the Notre Dame Global Adaptation Index, uh, showing that vulnerability across the region is decreasing across a number of indicators. Uh, still, there's much progress to me, Bain. Um, next, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the, uh, what, what this means for the role of uh, U.S. defense in disaster response. So, as Sharon mentioned, our program looks at the intersection of national security um, and climate change. So we, uh, we, we wanted to focus on what this means specifically for the U.S. military. Uh, this uh, photo is of the USNS Mercy uh, en route to respond to the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami. Um, her sister ship, the USNS Comfort, recently made the news arriving in New York for COVID-19 response, if that it looks familiar. Um, she's actually doing the same in Los Angeles. Uh, so these ships are currently deployed in the US. Um, the US military is often called upon to assist in disaster response efforts, both domestically and internationally. So while civilian and charity organizations uh, lead in disaster response, the military can play a crucial role in responding to the, the worst disasters. In particular, uh, defense forces are able to rapidly deploy to affected regions. They can deliver huge amounts of cargo, uh, provide personnel and infrastructure such as water purification and medical services. Um, this relief is essential when uh, local infrastructure and services are destroyed or overwhelmed. Um, an increase of risk at the extremes, uh, as, uh, as we're seeing in, in these climate indicators, suggests that demand for these missions uh, will be increasing in the future. So what can we do? Um, the first is that we should adjust our expectations about the frequency and severity of disasters. So climate change is already upon us. We already see the upward trend in historical data, and we should expect to continue to see changes into the future. Uh, meanwhile, growing populations and urbanization are, are creating the potential for more disruptive events. Mega cities in particular are, are, are especially vulnerable. Um, at the same time, infrastructure that's been designed for historical events uh, may no longer be sufficient. So uh, in the US, we often build flood infrastructure for a one in 100 year flood. This is a flood that happens on average 1% or a 1% chance for this flood to happen each year, um, a flood of that size. But we're, if floods are getting larger, this infrastructure may only be sufficient for a one in 50 year event. Um, this means improvements to infrastructure and changes to disaster plans will be necessary. Second is that we should focus on building resilience over just the response efforts. So being prepared for a disaster is often substantially less costly than it is to respond to them. And more importantly, it can help save many more lives. For example, um, a Bangla uh, Bangladesh's 1991 super typhoon Marion was one of the worst disasters in recent history. It killed over 130,000 people, which is truly an unimaginable amount. Um, just 15 years later, uh, an almost identical storm, Super Typhoon Sitter, which you can see on the screen, um, followed the same path, but resulted in almost 10 times fewer casualties because of improvements in early warning, evacuation, and simple cyclone shelters. The US military launched aid missions in response to both of these events. Um, but because of these improvements, uh, Cyclone Sitter was significantly less costly. Um, it was still by all accounts a terrible disaster, um, but the, the effectiveness of simple disaster preparedness 
uh, is clear. Finally, um, the world is more interconnected than, than ever. Uh, so the safety and, and prosperity of the American people depend not only on how we manage disasters in the US, but also around the world. Had COVID-19 been contained in its early days, uh, its impact would have been much lower. For other disasters, there's no contagion, but rather disruptions in global supply chains, uh, state fragility that might cascade to uh, migration um, and, and, and conflict, uh, human suffering, and, and just the, the pure moral imperative to act. Um, moreover, disaster response gives an opportunity for confidence building across nations, uh, be them allies or competitors. Uh, yet there is also the risk that be, it becomes an area of strategic competition, which becomes costly for everyone uh, affected. Uh, Sharon, would you like to add a few words here? Sure. Thank you, Francis, and thanks for the overview. And I'd you know, certainly call everyone's attention to the fact that there's a ton more detail in the report uh, and a lot more analysis and a lot of acknowledgement about the Sendai process and other um, and other ways that disasters are currently um, looked at. But, you know, we, as I said, as Francis said, we were particularly interested in the defense role in the defense community. And I, it's right now the, the sort of guiding light in the Pentagon is great power competition and lethality. And I think it's not lost on anyone that uh, that that sort of competition is spilling over into COVID and that the United States-China relationship um, right now is, is, you know, it's been increasingly adversarial over time. And with the pandemic, it's worse even than usual. So we're at a moment where, and, and you know, one aspect of that now is that the Chinese are, are very actively reaching out to countries all over the world to offer assistance for this particular disaster. Usually that's an American strength. We know this is what we do, and we're going to hear more about that from some of our other speakers. Um, right now, this can be a point of competition that we can lose or win in, and it could also be a point of cooperation. And it seems to me that we have a global moment here where the United States and China can work together in the interests of both countries and of all countries to manage what is going to be a, a catastrophic that, you know, fallout from this pandemic, both in terms of public health and economic consequences. So, you know, it is a point of competition right now. It, it could and should be a point of cooperation um, going forward, both for the sake of, of how we deal with the current crisis, but also, you know, the United States and China are on a path now to, you know, a very ruinous war that no one wants to fight and everyone will lose. So it seems to me that COVID it's a responsibility not only to handle this crisis better, but also to look at the larger uh, crisis there. Um, with that, I, Francis, you did get a very specific question from um, Jeff DeBelco, and I just wanted to pose that to you before we go into our chat uh, with our, our conversation with our panelists. Um, Jeff asked you about if your number one, uh, if your takeaway number one is the focus on preparing for the big events, um, is there any chance, um, if you look at the financial impacts, both direct and indirect, in addition to the death totals, that it, that, that changes? And I know you looked at both, at both the impact to human life and also the economic impact. So do you want to comment on that before we go into our conversation? Yeah. Um, if you look at the economic impact, the, uh, the pattern's similar, though less pronounced. So you still see the biggest events accounting for, or the top five events accounting for about 30% of total economic losses instead of 60% of deaths. Um, is, so it, it is significant. Um, I, I think what, what often is the case is that these largest events are the ones that overwhelm uh, local services, uh, infrastructure over top seawalls or, or, or other things because they're bigger than expected. And um, part of the, the message of focusing on the biggest events is that nearly everything is going to be bigger than expected in the future. Um, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, and I think also that, you know, understanding that the biggest events are the ones that, that are gonna overwhelm your services and that planning 
better resilience also helps with the costs of the smaller events. So exactly. it's both. So with that, what I'd like to do now is bring in all of our experts for the conversation. And Francis will still be here, and Aaron and Joe are still here. So uh, anybody who has questions, you'll be able to pose them to everybody. But first, I'd like to turn to David Titley. So if we can get him back up on the screen, great, thank you. Um, I'd like to turn to David Titley. So now, um, Dave is a nationally known expert in the field of climate, the Arctic, and national security. but I think of him as the only true climate security expert in the country. He is uh, both an officer and a scientist, and I'm sure a gentleman as well. So he's had a, he had a 32-year career in the Navy, um, rising to the rank of Rear Admiral, but he also has a PhD in meteorology. So that is just not that common. Um, and specifically for what we're talking about here, he also chairs the National Academies of Science Committee on extreme weather events and climate change attribution, meaning that um, you can't just say that a storm is a climate change event. Um, attribution is not is a slippery thing and a difficult science, and uh, but it's improving all the time. And Davis, David is the expert on that. So, I, what I was hoping you could talk to us about, uh, Dave, is the um, the climate projections, attribution science, and do we know enough? about future disasters to plan for them? You know, specifically, that does, does the Department of Defense know enough about future disasters to plan for them? Okay, well, thanks very much, Sharon. You guys can hear me, yes? Yes. Okay, I did, I did figure out the mute button. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, yeah, not, I don't think probably anybody on the, uh, on the discussion or on the panel is gonna be very shocked when I say, yes, we have a lot of information, and we have had information really for decades. Uh, I mean, you, you've worked in the Pentagon. I, I'll, I imagine many of the people, both certainly on the panelists as well as in the general audience here, have either worked in or with the Pentagon in the security establishment. And we all know that you know every day, that especially the more senior you are in the Pentagon, if you're not careful, from 0, 0600 to 1800 every day, Every 30 minutes, somebody's lined up outside your door to tell you how bad things are, what disaster is going to happen. But if you write me a check for $2 billion, I can maybe help you, right? I mean, that's what we get. We get, we get sort of uh, problem fatigue. And, and it's almost all framed as this is the DOD's problem, whether you want it or not, because you have the money. Uh, and, and yes, so you, you got to sort of put that kind of cynicism to the side and understand that there are sort of different, I'll call them qualities of predictions. Uh, and I think one of the things that really kind of separates, you know, some of the predictions are which ones are very dependent upon people and people response and which ones are relatively independent. So in the short to medium term, climate's pretty independent. There's basically about a 30 year lag between whatever policies, not only the United States, but really globally we have on greenhouse gases and when we're gonna see the change. And I'm, if somebody's interested in q and I can tell you why, but just kind of accept it's sort of a decadal kind of lag. So we've already heard that, you know, for the current pandemic, it's maybe a 10 to 15 day lag. This is about a 30 year lag. So given that, uh, you know, all we have to do now for the climate is all we have is, you know, nonlinear fluid dynamics with, you know, imperfect boundary and initial conditions. But compared to what the Intel community deals with every day, this is a piece of cake. Uh, and this is why you know, it is exceptionally difficult, and this is not a slam on the intel community, uh, to say what in any kind of granularity is the world going to look like, let's say, great power competition or a number of these other things 30, 40, 50 years in the future. On the continental and even subcontinental scale, the climate scientists can tell you that pretty well 30, 40, 50 years out. Uh, you know, barring some either huge super volcano, which would really cool down the atmosphere, or a massive, massive change in human greenhouse gases very, very quickly, which, again, you know, you, you can't rule things out, but it's, it's not, not impossible. Uh, I would absolutely agree with what I heard earlier here. I use a phrase 
uh, I think it comes from a guy named Burroughs, but he said, uh, the worst matters more than the bad. And I think that's kind of what you guys are, are talking about in your report. And that's how I, 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 talk about, I talk about this. And you're absolutely right. We are going to see uh, these, these higher extremes as you keep putting heat into the, uh, into the system. Uh, probably most people know here that over 90% of the excess heat is in fact going into the oceans. You know, and it takes a lot of energy to warm up water, but once that energy is there, it stays there for a long time and it, it becomes very, very powerful. So yes, we see additional rainfall. I sometimes call them rain bombs. Uh, we see them in the US. We certainly see them in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, you know, if you get the monsoons, we're seeing floods that, you know, we just simply haven't seen before in, in, in various places. Uh, when you get a typhoon, uh, it's still not quite clear that you're going to get more typhoons, but when you get a typhoon, the chance of that typhoon becoming very big and slower and, and not only stronger in winds, but also bigger, physically bigger, all of those slower, bigger, stronger storms contribute directly to storm surge. So, you know, the U.S. had Katrina uh, and Sandy. Those are probably the two most memorable storm surges in the last 20 years in, in the United States. Uh, high end is probably the iconic storm surge, at least for right now, in uh, the, the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, we've talked about some of the Bangladeshi storms, and, and those will, will be horrific because nobody's going to go and change the uh, hydrography of the Bay of Bengal. So it's, it's, again, it's just physics is what's driving this. Uh, so all of those are, yeah, you're, we're, going to, we're going to have those. We know that. I mean, it's really... You know, and I think this pandemic's pointed this out that, you know, even when you have reasonable predictions, you know, with some degree of fidelity and time and space, that's the easy part. The question is, is, you know, given all the other noise that we have and the press on current operations, and I've been a current ops guy in the fleet and everywhere else, and current ops sucks up every, every morsel of dollars and every morsel of brain power if you're not careful. Uh, and how are we going to, in fact, try to try to get ahead of this so that, as, as you've mentioned, as we all know, you know, some of the basic preparations. And I think I'll just close with this because I give, give everybody else an opportunity. I mean, I think some of what Bangladesh did is really tremendous and not that well appreciated when you we still have the horrific cyclones in the Bay of Bengal. Uh, but the fact that you no longer kill 100,000 people, maybe it's only three, 400. Now that's still, yeah, it's 300 people, but it's, you know, it's being able to take a group of 1,000 people and say, hey, 998 of you that would have died are not living. That's, that's, a, that's a pretty good story. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it wasn't a huge system. I mean, it's not like I would like to really live in those typhoon shelters they have or those cyclone shelters for any period of time, but they work. Uh, it will be very interesting. I mean, we're going through in the US right now, you know, just with the severe weather season, especially down in the Southeast US, uh, people are very concerned about between the COVID and storm shelter. You have a EF3 tornado coming at you. What do you do? Basically, oh, by the way, if you, you guys are in this, go to the storm shelter, okay? That's a much less risky thing to do than uh, see how your, how your personal house is gonna survive in an EF3 tornado. Uh, but that's a 15, 20 minute deal. What do you do when you're packed in into a hurricane or typhoon or cyclone shelter for four days? That's a very different timeline. And again, we've got you know, medical doctors of which I am not one. But, you know, my guess is the exposure of 10 or 15 minutes versus four days is a very, very different animal. So I think this is going to be a real, this is going to be an issue for the U.S., which we haven't really had a discussion on, but it's going to be an issue for a huge amount of the Western Pacific, certainly this year and, and perhaps in 2021 as well. So we're going to have to figure this out. Not only the response, but how do you... Uh, ensure that you you can keep the population safe. I don't have a great answer on that. I don't know what the answer is, but I sure hope we have uh, between 
epidemiologists and physicians and emergency managers really thinking very, very hard about that because this is coming. And, and you're right, you know, hope is a crappy strategy for avoiding disasters anywhere, and especially in the Indo-Pacific region, it does not work. Let me stop there, thanks. Just a, a quick follow-up question for you, Dave, before we, before we bring in some, the other speakers. Um, I did, you know, you had mentioned to me before, and I've noted down that you're on the National Academies uh, Committee that's looking at extreme weather events and attribution. Can any sneak previews about uh, yeah. anything well, new in there that, well, that yeah, should know? Well, it's actually really easy because we, we finished the report in 2016, so it's out. Uh, so if anybody uh, Googles uh, National Academy Extreme Weather Attribution, uh, you can read it. So, but let me actually give you one thing. And I think this was, yeah, this was public. So we had a National Academy convened, Joint National Academy and White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. And, and Calvin Drogemeyer himself uh, stayed for the whole thing, about three hours in a wonderful, wonderful Zoom conference, just like this. Uh, and we were looking at how to actually implement some of these recommendations the Academy has had on these climate reports, although nobody, we were all polite, so we did not use a C word, uh, but that's what it was. And one of the recommendations that got a lot of traction in the meeting, and, and I'll just say, I think is, would not shock me if I see it in legislation in the near term future, is how do we get the, really weather climate community at the seasonal level to start getting working hard to give much more granularity at what I call a prediction of extremes. So yes, some uh, extreme events, and, and I won't bore everyone here, there are some extreme events we have pretty good attribution for. Others like tornadoes, we have very poor. Hurricanes and typhoons are kind of in the middle for a specific storm, they're kind of in the middle. Uh, what we want to do is let's say at this time of year is to be able to say how much what is the potential of a high end or a katrina or a sandy how many of those we know what the historical level is is your risk going into now 50 percent greater is it greater for the philippines or greater for the korean peninsula uh what's the chance of getting a really big cyclone in the bay of bengal one two zero i mean and and you know, imagine a world where you could do that, but there's a reasonable amount of skill. You know, the no answer, the you're not going to have one of those would be very useful because then commanders and decision makers can take those resources and maybe do some other things with them. And conversely, of course, if you know you've got a pretty good shot at the big one, then you spend the money for uh, having the response and, and making sure that that's all good as opposed to Kind of everybody looking at each other's shoes when when really bad things happen and, and realize you're caught flat-footed there. So uh, that that recommendation is actually the very last recommendation in the 2016 National Academy report, and I was very happy that it got uh, pretty good traction at this I don't know, meeting of a hundred plus or minus, but also. I can just say here that I think there is a chance to see legislation with funding attached that is going to try to make that a national priority to, to really push on that. And I think that would be helpful, not only in the US, but frankly, uh, for, for commands like Indo-Pacific Com as well. And I have no doubt that Joe and Aaron would make good use of predictive <laughs> <laughs> data in their, in their model. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Rear Admiral Tidley, uh, Dave. So I, let's turn now to um, keeping it in the defense world to Ann Witkowski, who served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Stability and Humanitarian Affairs in the Office of the Secretary of Defense from 2014 to 2016. But she's also had a, a really impressive career throughout the defense community and is a seasoned professional in, in that world. And I did not realize, Ann, by the way, until I was looking at your bio in more detail, that once upon a time when you were a student at Yale, you also studied in Leningrad uh, in the USSR. So we have atomic brunette maybe. Um, but Anne served in the Pentagon, the State Department, and also in the National Security Council. So um, Anne, you know I, the things I wanna ask you are about how the Department of Defense prepares for um, 
these kinds of missions and do they prepare for them and should they be doing more and what should that look like? But I also wanted to read to you, uh, I mentioned that US Forces Korea sent us a list of lessons learned, which I will share. But there was a quote, a direct quote from General Abe Abrams, the commander there. Um, he said, the speed at which you can respond to a threat like COVID-19 is directly proportional to the strength of the host nation relationship. The close 70 year old United States and South Korea relationship was the critical enabler to our success. So I'd also be great if you could talk about, uh, you know, comment on that and the importance of partnerships and working together. Take it away. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And thanks for the opportunity to be on this panel today. I really enjoyed um, the report and I think it's a really important contribution to the policy literature and it's extremely timely. Uh, I'm going to take a, take a step back from and give you all a little bit of the practitioner's perspective from my time in the Pentagon uh, to talk <clears throat> about HADR. And I'll come back to the uh, quote from General Abrams as I do that. Uh, I, I, there's a lot of truth in what he says from my own experience as well, not surprising to you. Um, sort of taking a step back uh, and uh, let's see, zooming out the lens uh, to HADR worldwide and what the Pentagon uh, involves itself in, the Indo-Pacific region is the most active theater in the world for these activities and for good reasons, as you outline in a report, the region's history of disasters, earthquakes, floods, et cetera, and the United States' own active engagement in the response uh, to those participating uh, in support of our civilian partners and uh, most often with the international community as well. And we have, I think, a very good track record there. Um, that having been said, uh, listening to the, um, uh, the briefing on the report and having read the report, I hope that Pentagon leadership will acknowledge the trend lines and adjust its plan planning going forward <laughs> accordingly. Um, and that very much starts with uh, the planning documents and the planning cycle that the, that the Pentagon has and is a very, very long cycle. We just heard from Rear Admiral Titley and uh, climate scientists are looking 30 years out. Well, the planning cycle for the Pentagon is two to four years out, depending on which planning documents we're talking about. So we need to be starting now. And we can see before our very eyes, the prospect of a complex, what we would call a complex emergency, an earthquake or flooding together with a pandemic. And, uh, and that is something that we really need to think very hard about. And there are two ways really that, um, that the Pentagon is engaged in planning. We've talked about HADR, Humanitarian Assistance and Disaster Response. Uh, and I think it's important to pull those pieces apart a little bit, uh, especially coming back to what General Abrams just said uh, through his memo to you about the importance of the relationship because the HA part is very much about building relationships with other nations, enhancing resilience, which your own report underscores is extremely important, uh, plan to work with other militaries and with our civilian partners in a response. There's a lot to this piece. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about what that looks like. We've got a dedicated funding line for humanitarian assistance in the, in the Pentagon. Uh, it's called ODACA, that's the acronym, Overseas Humanitarian Disaster and Civic Aid. And it's got a specific set of authorities associated with the funding line that has to have a humanitarian nexus and serve civilian populations. And this funding provides a really critical opportunity for engagement with partner countries, uh, building that capacity and that resilience that we've already been talking about and ultimately facilitating more effective response in a disaster. Because if you've built out the infrastructure and you've developed the working relationships, uh, that's a good thing. The greater the resilience, the better the relationship. The greater the resilience, the less DOD will be called upon, the better the relationships, the more rapid the response is just pointed out. And that's all good. Um, all regional combat commands have some measure of humanitarian assistance activities and the Indo-Pacific Pacific region, I'd say, um, greater, greater, than the, greater than the others. Uh, we've talked about the Bangladesh experience and how uh, the building of resilience there has brought down casualties in the cyclone context. My own experience is with uh, Nepal, uh, 
Uh, I was in the Pentagon during the Nepal earthquake in April of 2015. Um, that quake and its aftershock caused a disaster of really staggering proportions for the Nepalese, killed more than 8,700 people, destroyed more than half a million homes, affected nearly a third of the country. We ourselves lost six Marines and two Nepalese partners on a helicopter rescue mission in the mountains um, during the response was an international response to which DOD plugged in to USAID and the international community and deployed a joint task force. Uh, it included some special operators that were already there that were repurposed for bringing folks down off of Mount Everest. We uh, provided airlift, airfield services, and search and rescue with about 900 personnel. By far and away, hardly shows a blip on that graph that you um, that Francis uh, showed us. But in that context was, uh, <clears throat> was a major, uh, was, was required a major response in the, in the Nepalese context itself. So just a couple of really specific points about that response. Prior to the earthquake, U.S. Pacific Command at the time, it was in, now into Pacific Command, had worked with the Nepalese government on initiatives specifically designed to mitigate the impact of an earthquake. Um, one example is the building of deep tube wells. Now these wells were able to provide water and power after the quake in the Kathmandu Valley to a number of displaced people. We built, helped build infrastructure like emergency operations centers and had conducted just two years prior to the actual earthquake, a field training exercise focused on an earthquake. And this type of example just really illustrates how important these long lead times are, uh, how we need to plan out, how we need to look ahead, and hopefully how we can take some of this climate science and build it into uh, elevated um, priority for, for the planning. Now, that's humanitarian assistance, uh, better um, and more robust humanitarian assistance activities in advance bilaterally and also multilaterally, by the way. Uh, can equal improved disaster response. We've got a lot of other activities that help us plan specifically for disaster response. A couple of them include uh, training courses uh, where DOD works to uh, develop relationships or understand the relationships with our civilian partners, humanitarian assistance response training, health emergencies and large populations training, and of course exercises, the large of largest of which and the most well known is RIMPAC or the Rim of the Pacific exercise. Um, and so these are all really important ways that DOD prepares. Maybe there should be more of this in the future. One point I do want to underscore, it was touched on a little bit at the beginning of the, of the um, session, is that DOD always uh, operates in support of civilian agencies. So we're never out in front or we shouldn't ever be out in front. And in this case, the civilian agency we support most often or always in these experiences is USAID, with whom we have a really, the DOD has a great working relationship. Um, and uh, that, uh, uh, the relationship uh, utilizes the military when it can provide a unique capability or when a civilian response is overwhelmed, as has already been said in your report, I think it's worth underscoring that this unique capability could be like bridging a gap uh, and lift to move people around or communications when communications are damaged. But at a time when the civilian uh, entities, organizations and civilian side of governments are completely overwhelmed. So there's a limitation around where uh, DOD should be operating uh, and, um, and there's a, a, a real importance to its planning in uh, concert with its own civilian partners and with the international community. Now, let me just say a quick word about pandemics, because I also happen to be in the Pentagon during the Ebola response. Uh, we're in an infectious disease pandemic. I'm sure that all of our terrific personnel, civilian and military, are, much as they don't like it, learning uh, learning as they go right now and how best to respond and how best to prepare to protect our personnel. But let me just stand back for a moment and offer a few big points about planning for a pandemic, whether it's um, a pandemic on its own or a complex emergency like the one we may face right now, a pandemic combined with say an earthquake or a flood. First of all, 
infectious disease can unfold uh, at first more slowly. That's what happened with Ebola. It's a little bit of what we saw with the coronavirus, or as we're seeing with the coronavirus in some places. But we know the toll is much higher when the response is delayed. So in a scenario where the US might be thinking about supporting the international community, it's easy to look back and say, <clears throat> we didn't move quickly enough. Certainly in the case of the Ebola response, we were criticized for not moving fast enough in some quarters by some. Um, but then when we went in big with troops and lift and construction of Ebola treatment units and healthcare uh, worker training in West Africa, there was another part of the community that said, um, you know, the, the question, the wisdom of committing all these assets when we have so many other priorities, had so many other priorities uh, at the time, it turned out to be the right call. It wasn't really clear to everyone at the front end and took a bit to secure support for that. Um, other questions that we encountered in the Ebola response and folks on the ground are encountering today. How does DOD provide the necessary force health protection for our military personnel? What's the level of risk to force that our country, our Congress, our people, and our military are willing to accept in the case of an infectious disease pandemic? And to what extent will DOD be willing and able to deploy its own military personnel and on what scale? What about our laboratories? These are questions that we encountered in Ebola. We haven't yet, I don't believe, joined on all of them in the case of this particular response. But if we're looking out to an instance in which we're gonna see more pandemics in the future, we really need to join these difficult questions. And I don't think that we're ready. We're just not ready. A DOD is not necessarily ready. Um, to respond to a complex emergency in the way that I think we would all like. Um, but DOD is not alone. The interagency is not sufficiently prepared either. And the work to prepare needs to be done together across the US government using the lessons learned from Ebola and also as we're learning them from coronavirus. So just to sort of wrap this a bit into a bow and to come back to something you said, Sharon, a little bit at the front end, and, Ad and Admiral Titley touched on as well. The Pentagon prioritizes our offense and our defense, our war fighting and our deterrence capabilities, but we cannot underserve HADR planning, particularly uh, given the kinds of issues that you pointed out in this report. Disasters are not going away and the big ones are coming. So commensurate with assessment of what's projected for the future of the Indo-Pacific region, I would say three things. We need robust HADR preparation, including the elevation of pan the pandemic planning piece, which is hard. Um, that means uh, properly written into guidance and it means properly resourced. Uh, second, we need robust interagency coordination. Um, I imagine that we still have extremely excellent interagency coordination in the field. We also need strong leadership at the highest levels to help elevate the issue and to do the necessary planning and preparation. And then third, I think we need to ask ourselves, uh, given where uh, we may be headed, uh, what do we do to reinforce maximal cooperation internationally in a disaster response scenario with our allies and friends? And the question that you put to us, Sharon, earlier, uh, when our competitors like China are increasingly active uh, in these kinds of situations. So I think we have a really, DOD is a great foundation in its experience in the, region, in the region and the assets that it already can bring to bear on it, but we got a lot of work ahead. Thank Dr. you, Ann. Yeah. No, that was, that was great. And, um, and you set up uh, more conversation in a variety of ways. Um, and a comprehensive answer, including we already have an audience question that that kind of got at something that you talked about, which we can bring back up later. Um, you said we're not ready, and then you gave the three things that you think we need to do. Is there is there anything else that you think? I mean, because this is on us, this is happening, and and we could be talking about near term, or we could be talking about the winter when when it comes back. Um, is there anything that you think? we need to do right now to be to improve immediate readiness? Well, um, it's hard for me, I, I can, 
One thing we need to make sure that we, one thing that I think that would be very um, helpful to focus on, uh, and frankly, where we fell short in the Ebola response, and this is very well documented in all the lessons learned documents from that response, is to define the roles and responsibilities of all agencies so that there is a common set of expectations of what's going to be brought to bear in the event of um, whatever it is that we're planning for. And I would put that way, way up at the top of my priority list. And one of the reasons that we wanted to look at defense, you know, for a variety of reasons, but one of them was that we wanted to look specifically at what assets are most important for for when the military is involved in a humanitarian or disaster response um, event and how frequently are those assets used and you know there's an opportunity cost for those assets of course and there's very specific things the large cargo aircraft amphibious ships and what else francis uh rotary aircraft um, of course right yep. so helicopters that are that are heavily used and we were really interested in whether or not the military sees that as an opportunity cost because of course those assets are also very important for war plans and campaign plans do you think there's awareness of that um well, i can't speak specifically to indo-pacific command i can speak to my own experience again harking back to ebola there's always a tension in the use of assets these are these are extremely valuable assets and so when we are looking at uh, when the US government's looking at how it's going to respond to a disaster, it's it really is in the moment. And in the case of um, the Ebola response, we deployed a number of our very valuable Ospreys down to West Africa, down to Liberia. That's Those, a tilt rotor aircraft. The rotary aircraft, right. Uh, and they proved incredibly valuable in the response, frankly, not only because of the lift that they were able to provide in the country, but they were also a really important symbol of the American presence um, <clears throat> in that response. Uh, those are the same rotary aircraft that we might you know, need in other types of cases in a, I'm just speaking in a, in a sort of theoretical way, uh, those could be used for responding to uh, embassy security incidents or uh, something like that. So. Um, so it's it's hard to say exactly um, you know what the what the trade-offs are um, at any particular moment. Um, the U.S. military has always been there when asked. It's always been there, and I think in a future case it would be there again. Um, uh, yeah, and we were just. Yeah. Wondering though if that becomes a bigger ask than it has been in the past, you know, then how, where are the trade offs? Is, you know, sort of the kinds of questions that we were looking at. But uh, yeah, that's, I think you're the three things you laid out are part of working that out in advance. No. Um, one thing that you mentioned, Anne, was uh, that, that, of course, the, the, the military is not in the lead on. <laughs> disaster relief that actually for the United States, both at home and overseas, civilians are in charge and the military is a supporting um, element. And I know you wouldn't know that from the discussion so far. As I said, we chose to focus on the Department of Defense for a variety of reasons, including that um, they have a very, very big budget and the gentleman we're about to hear from, his organization has a very, very small budget. Um, Al Dwyer is the Senior Regional Advisor for U.S. Agency for International <clears throat> Development's Office of <clears throat> U.S. Foreign Disaster Assistance. Now, if you don't know this, this organization, OFTA, by its acronym, uh, this is the lead agency for the United States of America in responding to foreign disasters. And Al, I have to tell you that um, I was trying to find a, you know, I've long thought with great admiration of OFTA, and I was trying to look up a quote or something and came across a government accountability office report that said that um, everybody basically said everybody likes OFTA, uh, you know, NGOs, the UN, and the military and other agencies, everyone thinks well of OFTA. And that is, that is uh, saying no small thing. So um, can you talk to us a little bit about what, you know, how OFTA works and how it plans for the future? Great, thank you very much. And uh, Francis, I just wanted to commend you on the report. You know, being being in the field for the last 25, 28 years, seeing some of those conclusions, uh, I, I agree with you. And I also, you know, the big one, 
that's something we've got to keep in mind. So, yeah, I'm with OFTA, Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance. Unfortunately, we're about to be merged into what's called the Bureau of Humanitarian Affairs. So it's going to be the end of an era. But and myself, I'm the senior regional advisor. I'm based out of Bangkok. My day job is my AOR is really Mongolia, China, Burma, everything to Hawaii. So 32 countries. And I'll, I'll talk about that. But of course, I, as Ann knows, I deploy globally. I work uh, issues all over the world. But I think what I wanted to say about uh, Asia and uh, some of the topics here is, you know, we just cannot ignore some of the growing response capacity that is inherent in, in countries like Indonesia and the Philippines and really all around the region. And as people, people know often for the response, you know, I manage a team of 10 regional advisors based all over Southeast Asia and stuff. And yeah, our job is to, you know, get on the plane that night and hit the ground and do the initial assessment and work with people like Aaron and the Mercy Corps and the UN. But uh, the other thing we've been doing over the last 10 years, it doesn't get a lot of attention is what we call disaster risk reduction. And let me just tell you a little bit of story here. So I got to Bangkok in 2008 and, you know, at the time we were responding between 25 and 30, what we call disaster declarations a year. And this is when a host nation is affected by a disaster and they request international assistance, particularly with the United States, 25 a year. Now, in 2018, 2019, we're averaging three to five a year. So, you know, what happened? There hasn't been a reduction of disasters in, in Asia and the Pacific. But what we've done over those last 10 years is we've invested in local capacity. And, uh, but, you know, it's not just our investment. There's a lot of things that have been going on in Asia and they should figure into your calculus. A lot of the countries in Asia you know, have passed legislative new laws and everything. They've created these national disaster management organizations like the FEMA. Uh, they've put line items into their budgets. They professionalize them. I think uh, on top of that, you've got a much more aggressive media all throughout Asia. Okay, when there is a disaster and there's not a local response or something like that, and I'll bring up Rappler, for example, in the Philippines, there's a lot of pressure politically. And I think the last thing to mention out in Asia uh, I think reduction is, is really nationalism. You know, it's, you know, in the old days, 10 years ago, I can remember say in the Philippines or Indonesia, we'd have two or three events where we'd go in with the Marine Corps and help out on a disaster. But, you know, that's just not the case anymore for some of the reasons I've mentioned. So again, I think my first point is, and we, we invest anywhere between 40 to $60 million a year in this disaster risk reduction. And we focus it really on three things. We, try to capacitize those national disaster management organizations like the FEMAs in each host country. We also put a lot of resources into what we call first responders. And a lot of times that's the Red Cross or that's local NGOs uh, build their capacities. Early warning systems, for example, uh, PDC we're working closely with to give that country that capacity to do that early warning and that sort of thing. And of course, there's always that community-based stuff. You know, a lot of these communities get hit by the same typhoon every year, the drought or the flood. So to really strengthen them. So again, uh, we're down to about three to five disaster response requests a year from countries. And again, I think Ann pointed out as well, you know, when DOD goes in or OFTA goes in, it has to be at the request of the host nation. So small to medium disasters now throughout Asia there is not that ask for international assistance, but there is, and so you might say, well, Al, what are you doing all the time? Well, I'm spending half my time in the Middle East. I'm half spending half my time in my team in Latin America or something like that. So that's a good news story. But as I said, there is the same amount of disasters, if not more. We talk about these black swan events or these super problems like the high ends. You know, I, you heard about Haiyan's 100-year event, and then Sendai's 100-year event, and then, you know, these bushfires I just got back from in Australia, another 100-year event. Well, it seems like we're having a lot of 100-year events. And, you know, and again, the, the work with the DOD, one of, one of the things that uh, Ann talked about is, you know, they do play an important role. And, you know, they do bring what we call a unique capacity. And we're hand in glove and so I agree just a little bit. That's a little bit of background. So what do we do in the future? I think we continue along the same track. 
you know, we make investments in building that local capacity because, A, they're the, they've got the best knowledge. They're going to be the first responders. They're actually going to make the difference on the ground in that first 72 hours, for example. It's important. But, you know, there's going to be times where they're overwhelmed. Some of these countries are still developing, of course. And, you know, when you bring in a unique capacity, like primarily with DOD, it's lift. You know, we, we, we move things from point A and B. I can remember in Hyann when I was down there, uh, putting together an airport or something like that, there, there's nobody better than the DOD. And again, I think they have been forward leaning. I mean, there's more ask than there is request, of course, but we have to be ready because we can't be late. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, there's a lot of other players in the sea. You know, Japan's now getting more and more involved. You see the Koreans showing up with the C-130s. You know, China, uh, not militarily right now, but boy, they would, I remember, I think it was in high end, they wanted to bring in one of their ships, you know, the Mercy ship, the hospital. So that competition is there. Uh, I'm very aware of it. It's, it. it's part of our calculations. But, you know, again, I'm more of an operator. My job is to get on the ground, provide that proprietary information, make things happen. But again, at the request of that affected and host nation. So... I agree, interagency cooperation is, 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 is critical. And, you know, just understanding, I, I was the DART team leader for the Ebola response. I was also the DART team leader for the CIDAR response. Again, great examples of DOD and uh, USAID cooperation. Um, but, and I think the, as the Admiral said, you know, well, well, what is next? Well, we know it's gonna be something next. How do you plan specifically? details you can't. You just have to be ready for the inevitable. And, you know, and I, a lot of times I call it the fog of response. You know, those initial days after a, I don't know, some, somebody had that, the fog of war. I've kind of stolen that, call it the fog of response. But those initial 72 hours where we're, we're calculating what are the needs and what are the permissions and, you know, does Japan have a sofa to come in with the United States? There's all kinds of these questions that I think a lot could be eliminated beforehand, and I know there's a lot of effort to do it, but every disaster is indeed unique. So you have to be ready for anything and be ready to do what you can at the time. So I'll leave it at that. I know. Uh, thank you, Al. Well, thank yeah, you. I, I have done an exceptionally poor job of time management for our event. So uh, I want to give uh, Erin Carter a chance to, to say something because she has an important role to play in, uh, in any disaster response. She is the Senior Director for Humanitarian Response at Mercy Corps, which is a fabulous non-governmental organization that's in maybe 40 countries around the world, more than 6,000 staff, and they cover the waterfront from violent conflict to humanitarian response. So Erin, it would be really interesting now, you've had a chance to listen to all this, yep. and uh, what, from your point of view, uh, as a, as a non-governmental player all over the world on these kinds of events, um, particularly looking at the future, how are you planning for things? What do you think about all of this? Great. So happy to talk. Thanks for having me. Um, and hi, everybody out there. Um, thanks for joining us. So Mercy Corps is a non-governmental organization. We were founded in 1979. We have about four, we work in about 40 countries and have about 6,000 staff. 87% of them are national staff from the countries that they're hired from. So we're an international organization with a pretty local footprint. And we have delivered about $4 billion of assistance over the last um, 39 years we've been working. I work on our humanitarian team, which is the team that does the rapid response, works with OFDA, um, and we sit within a larger framework of long-term development program and resilience work within Mercy Corps structure. So for, for our humanitarian work, what we tend to focus on is um, in both rapid onset emergencies and complex crises. So if you think about the world, you think about Northeast Nigeria, Syria, Yemen, Colombia, Venezuela, all the way across the Asia Pacific um, through Indonesia, Timor, India, Nepal, Mongolia, Myanmar, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Mercy Corps works in all of those places. Um, and I, what I find pretty when we do first phase emergency response, right? It looks very similar in many of the places. What I find um, that Mercy Corps is able to do is fairly quickly move from the immediate emergency 
meeting immediate emergency needs into the medium term recovery. And so there are ways that you can do peace building work during humanitarian response. There are ways that you can start connecting and rebuilding markets, reinforcing livelihoods, activities, and focusing on recovery. And for us, this sits within a larger framework of resilience because everyone who works in emergencies knows and has seen that your first responders are always local. So we have tremendous plans to move millions of dollars worth of support and equipment that is much, much needed in many places, but there is always a gap from when the emergency and the disaster happens to when assistance arrives. And so your support is the neighborhood and the communities that you work in. So building resilience, coping, um, social cohesion and social capital um, are some of the strongest ways that communities will survive crises. And so I echo Al's points about disaster risk reduction, as well as climate change and adaptation are some of the key areas that will help communities work through the disasters that we, we have great data show will inevitably happen in many of these places that we work in. I have, um, I was listening to our list and I have to say, I, <laughs> I have been in most of the biggest ones that we've listed or have been supporting from our headquarters. And so when we look at the list of Pakistan earthquake, Haiyan, Nargis, Sichuan, the tsunami, Harvey and Nepal, <laughs> we could probably have another session where we talk about all of the things that we learned from those. There's also a really interesting piece for Mercy Corps in this because we work across, um, we work across settings, right? So we see that it is much easier for us as a nonprofit, non-governmental organization to engage with US military in um, settings that are not um, complex crises. So we have a lot of rules um, internally um, for being impartial and for being how, how we're approached by communities and how we approach communities for the ways that we engage with US military or military in general in settings like Syria and Yemen and Iraq, et cetera. When natural disasters happen, it provides us a different opportunity for engaging with, with military and with US government, DOD in particular, um, because it provides an opening that feels in many ways very apolitical in ways that violent conflict is not. And so it gives us a chance to be a little bit more directly engaged, especially through USAID and our OFDA partners, to be able to work directly with military in ways that we absolutely do not see possible in complex crises. So I think that that's an interesting dimension of natural disasters, especially in the Asia Pacific region, where we see, where we have seen and worked with um, US military um, in ways that we have not in other places in the world and, and likely will not be able to. Um, I would say that you, you had sent me a question about what are some of the trends that are on our minds um, as we're as a, a nonprofit and a NGO thinking about what, what this all means for us. We're doing um, our, we have been tremendously impacted by COVID as everyone has. And so we have COVID response programs that are underway and we are also able to continue delivering existing programs in some of our countries, making modifications. So thinking about ways that we have to adapt our distributions to make sure they're social distancing because in some places we are the providers of social safety nets programs. So it's hard to stop work when you know that people won't get cash if your program stops. So we have to work pretty hard to figure out what are the ways that we can change our programs in order to be able to continue to do to deliver the programs that people depend on. So with COVID, it gives us another sort of another dimension to think about. And one of the pieces that Mercy Corps is working on right now is to frame up what we're calling some assumptions that our country teams need to have in their minds as they consider how to respond to natural disasters in a pandemic. Because we know that some of the business as usual ways that we work, flying people in, bringing supplies in, may not be possible outside of large, perhaps military, perhaps very large um, World Food Program funded air bridges, things like that, which we don't see in place yet. So we have to, again, reinforce local leadership and local solutions in order to be better prepared at community level for the disasters that we know will happen in Asia Pacific. I will say that for us, um, some big things that we're thinking about is about the connection between climate and conflict. 
And so we see that um, across the world where we understand, you know, the United Nations reports that climate related disasters um, account for more than 90% of the world's disasters from 1998 to 2017. We also now have new research that's come out that says um, a new study, and my colleague sent me this by the Potsdam Institute um, for Climate Impact Research, found that almost one third of all conflict on sets in vulnerable countries over the recent decades have been preceded by a climate related disaster within seven days. So there is, there is a real connection for us between the climate impacts that we understand are happening in the world, the disasters that we're seeing and the violent conflict that is arising. And for us to work not just on natural disasters, but to consider the ways that climate change is impacting the dimension of disasters is also a pretty important piece for us. And we work on that through a number of ways that I won't, I won't get into today, but perhaps could be another conversation. Um, so I will say that with climate um, changing, um, disasters seem to be also changing and conflict seems to be going up, um, all sort of packaged in dynamic and interesting ways together. Um, we also see forcibly displaced people continue to be um, moving at record levels and that is concerning in a number of ways for us, right? Um, I'll just be brief because we're, we're close, but food insecurity is rising. That's connected to climate change. That's also true across the Asia Pacific where we think about like just so much availability but struggle with access. Um, and then finally, I would say that some of the future, future work that's ahead of us around disasters and I think is particularly terrifying right now is urban settings. So with pandemics in urban centers being fairly bad, um, the potential for climate related disasters on top of that, as well as natural disasters. And then knowing that people are home, knowing that people can't leave and understanding what's the conflict that will eventually arise in those cities, I think it's pretty scary. So if we have a hurricane or a typhoon that hits a major metropolitan area, that's also experiencing a high prevalence of uh, COVID-19 right now, as well as potential historical unrest within those communities. I think that that's a pretty um, worrying scenario for all of us that I can't say that any of us are well prepared to, to address. And then finally, because I'm a nonprofit, I will say that systematic underfunding of humanitarian response <laughs> continues to be something that we struggle with, not only from a nonprofit perspective, but also from um, UN appeals consistently underfunded, as well as a lack of funding available for climate related work means that we continue to operate as best we can with the resources that are available, but tremendously underfunded. So I think I'll say, I think I'll end with that, except I think maybe I made my point already, but um, how is our organization thinking about the future? I've, you know, local leadership will be, I think, the way forward. And this is a particularly sobering moment for all of us as we are international and we are local. Um, what is that going to mean? So is this the time to fundamentally transform the global humanitarian system to truly shift power and resources into local leadership? Um, it feels like this is giving us a hint mm -hmm. of what the future will look like. And as someone who, who lives, I live in New Orleans, so I have heard some of your, your comments about your local recovery and infrastructure behind schedule. So it's, it's personal as well as professional about what I think it means to be a local responder in a global world. So thank you. Thank you, Erin. That was at once both depressing and uplifting. <laughs> so that's a nice balance to achieve. So we're actually at time, but we're going to quickly take a couple of questions before we wrap it up. Um, and uh, I would like, I, one of them I think is something that Anne can knock out pretty quickly. Somebody asked about the medical capacity at the Department of Defense and whether the Department of Defense has the capacity to just handle the pandemic. Um, given your, your experience with Ebola, I think you probably know the answer to that pretty, pretty simply. Yeah, the issue, yes, we, the, the department has substantial medical capacities and the department does have considerable engagement with other countries around the world on the medical front, whether it's um, uh, related to actual um, 
uh, provision of medical services or uh, laboratory uh, cooperation. However, the way that the department is structured is such that our medical providers are really primarily oriented and designed to support our own military. And I think there's broadly speaking um, a lack of understanding that that is generally the case. Having said that, I think um, based on our experience in the Ebola response and now the domestic response in the United States to COVID, uh, the Department of Defense really needs to plan and prepare for asks along these lines for medical support when it's needed. And, um, and that would be, I think, high on my list for consideration when I talk about doing um, more robust planning for these kinds of scenarios in the future. I think, for example, if you look at India, you're talking about 1.3, 1.4 billion people and uh, a medical system that doesn't have the capacity for response to COVID. The Department of Defense can't begin to, <laughs> to cover that gap. We can't cover it here in the United States, uh, which I think has been very clear, is that for something on this scale, DOD doesn't begin to have the capacity for that. Um, Joe and Aaron, you had posed a question for Al. Do you want to go ahead and ask him yourselves what you were, what you wanted to know from him? I, I was really looking both for Aaron and for Al, interested, you know, in the next six months. Uh, and Aaron kind of alluded a little bit to this. In the next six months, what is the process change that needs to be quickly implemented to be able to still serve partners and lo support locally in this current constrained environment? Oh, Al, you gotta unmute yourself. Yeah, I apologize. So just real quick on OFTA, the COVID is actually being led by the uh, USAID Office of Global Health in my organization. However, we are playing a role and our role is, you know, we have two what's called complex humanitarian emergencies, one in Burma with the Rohingya, where we've been for a number of years. The other one's down in Mindanao with the earthquakes and some of the displacement around Marawi. So we are beefing up in there to provide support and the Pacific as well. Uh, look, it, it's still kind of business as usual. You, you talked about Typhoon Herald. We just had four disaster declarations, Vanuatu, Solomon Islands, Tonga, and Fiji, where we did get support out. Now we're doing it remotely. We're, we're making adjustments on the fly, but you know, we're working with partners on the ground that are following local protocols or aware of it, little less on the internationals flying in, obviously, because like, for example, in Vanuatu, they're not allowing in inter international cargoes or international expats to respond. So there are workarounds and we're just figuring that out as we go, over. I, I will say, Al, I know the, the work that OFTA does for assessments really right in the first couple of days really serves as the underpinning for decision making and that in particular i have interest in you know how that's going to still happen if it's just locally or whether or not there are going to have to be additional measures taken because i do know that that's that by far is the foundation not only within the u.s but seen as an authoritative source for data and information globally so it's triangulation, it's using your products, it's using, talk, we're talking to local partners. You know, I mentioned our disaster risk reduction programs throughout the region. So we have partners on the ground. And it's right now it's triangulation. Yeah, normally we'd be on the ground within 24 hours for proprietary information. Uh, so again, it's, uh, it's something we're working through as we go forward, but you know, it's partners like you that uh, we're relying on to develop that in, under these conditions, over. From the Mercy Corps perspective, there's a couple of things. So at an international level, we're doing two levels of, of advocacy, right? One is to existing donors for increased flexibility for NGOs to be able to continue operating because we depend on donations, right? So we have some tremendous constraints just in a business model for an NGO perspective right now. So there's tremendous advocacy that we're doing around that and by and large are getting quite a lot of leadership actually from USAID on that and really setting the tone for other donors. Um, we also need more funds available. We cannot respond to COVID, continue social safety net and life-saving programs and respond with constrained resources, which is where we are right now. Um, internally, um, we're producing a lot of tip sheets and fact sheets for our teams to be able to start making changes that they need now 
start reviewing their business continuity plans and their emergency preparedness plans to make sure that they've made changes and are not working to, on the assumptions that they've had from previous emergencies because we know that they will not follow through on this one. So it's a lot of internal work in terms of just getting people where they need to be to think about this season of hurricanes and typhoons and all the stuff. It's hard right now because people are tired. And so while we have this season ahead of us, um, the restrictions that are in place because of COVID are causing lots of burdens. And so staff can't be in offices. It's hard that Ramadan will start tomorrow. So it's hard for people to think about what's next when they're struggling through what's happening today. So I just think it's also a difficult time for team members around the world. And so it's, it, it's just something that we have to manage, right, in terms of our own restrictions and the needs of a mission-driven organization to be able to respond to the disasters that are ahead of us in a responsible way that meets humanitarian needs, but also doesn't put extraordinary risk on the staff that we, work, that we ask to, to go out into the field and do this work. Um, so from, I thought there was something else, but I seem to have lost my last point. Well, I think also just uh, Lauren Reese from the Woodrow Wilson Center asked a very similar question, which was um, that you've done a good job of talking about the risks and that, that climate change and COVID now are both compound cascading risks and how is this changing your strategies? And I think you both, you all addressed that, but if you wanted to add anything else specific on that, how do you plan for cascading compound risks? And then we'll have one last question. I don't have an answer for that exactly, but I will say that the one thing that I forgot to mention is that Mercy Corps also has what's called our crisis analysis team. And that team looks at like big data and lots of trends founded in local information. And we're producing reports that are second, the secondary impacts of COVID on the communities and the countries that we work in. So we're doing some additional layering of analysis to help teams think through what are not just like your immediate economic impacts, your immediate social impacts, but what are some of the secondary impacts that sort of cascade across your country and community? So that's helping us be a little bit, think, think a little bit bigger than, than the immediate right now. I'll let someone else answer about cascading risk. Anybody else want to weigh in on that before we go to our last question? I will just say that this is a question that's come up quite a lot in the last two weeks with Indo-PACOM leadership. And something that I know that the J9 and the All Hazards group at Indo-PACOM is looking at quite heavily is both the direct and indirect impact of this crisis and how that might have cascading effects with natural hazards or you know, humanitarian crisis. So I am at least happy to see that there are a lot of people looking at this question. I don't know everybody has the answer just, just yet. And it's hopefully we'll come together collectively with, with some good guidance. Fast, yeah. Very fast. <laughs> Dave, did you have a, you gotta unmute yourself first if you want us to hear you. There, yeah, you, there go. you go. Uh, yeah, I, I think this actually gets back to Anne's point of a few minutes ago on, you know, sort of capacity within, within the DOD. And yeah, there's a lot of capacity and no, it's not enough. And yes, it's for military. Uh, I'll just give you one example. When I was commander of Naval Meteorology and Oceanography Command, which is based down on the Mississippi-Louisiana border, uh, after Katrina, U.S. NORTHCOM, through the naval component of NORTHCOM, uh, directed me to have, I think it was three hydrographic survey teams on a 72-hour alert during U.S. hurricane season. Now, these are worldwide deployable, and normally they're out in either, you know, back then in PACOM or CENTCOM or wherever, uh, but post Katrina, uh, the DOD basically said, hey, we're going to, you know, through NORTHCOM, we're going to have this close enough so that when we have a uh, catastrophe in the homeland, we can, we, we will respond. And I don't know whether or not those same dynamics are going to play out. I have no idea on, you know, post, uh, post pandemic here, but that was certainly one of the fallouts of, of Katrina is the DOD had to keep uh, assets that would have deployed otherwise reasonably close to to Connus. So this is it. My tether was seventy two hours. Uh, for to finish on a radically different note, um, stay live there because this might be one you want to answer. 
we had a couple of questions about China and, and about China as a superpower ambitious country um, going into providing this kind of aid. And it's been very clear that they've done that in the current crisis. Um, and one of the questions was, do you really think the United States and China can cooperate in this, in this area? Um, and Admiral, Dave, any, any comments on that? I have a lot, but I'm not going to say them. Uh, I think one of the things of being an expert is knowing what you're not an expert in, <laughs> uh, which, you know, immediately kicks you off of 90% of cable TV. But yeah, it's, it's very, very interesting. And all I can say is I hope not only at the uh, combatant commands, but also at OSD and the Joint Staff, the National Security Council, uh, I'm, I'm really hoping we have some people thinking through this very, very hard. You can just see in open source uh, what the government of China has been doing for some time, and I would go back 20 years, but certainly in the last six months. And uh, yeah, there's, there's somebody mentioned this is an inflection point. I would agree it's an inflection point. I'm not sure it's one for the better, but I think there are going to be uh, some some precautions, but let me just stop there. Anne, any thoughts? Yeah, I think I'll. Am I on mute? No, I'm not on mute. Um, I think um, Admiral Titley put it very well. I hope that uh, there are folks on the inside right now looking hard at these trend lines. Uh, I'll also add that I think. Um, if you're looking at the cooperation piece, which is one that you raised, the point that you raised right at the beginning of the conversation, Sharon, and it's been raised again in this question, uh, it's complicated. I think it's one that should be looked at, but it is, it's, it's, it's complicated. Uh, we have had periods of um, limited cooperation, mill-mill um, cooperation, and there's, no reason to believe we couldn't at some point get back to that, but there are a lot of other factors involved. So I think there's value in raising the issue and we need, we need to really look at it hard, what it means for US interests. Erin, yeah. At an operational level, Mercy Corps has been working in China for I think the last 15 years. And we have some great partnerships with Gongos, right, the governmental, non-governmental organizations. Um, and so while we don't have programming anymore in China, it is strictly a partnership office that does a lot of work with encouraging Chinese um, uh, bilateral assistance to countries of interest in China. So they've done some work across Africa. They're also doing some work in eight different parts of Asia. So I think, um, in, a, in that way, we've had some successes and we have some great engagement and partnership with the non-governmental organizations that we're working with in China. So at that level, I see a lot of camaraderie and I also see a lot of willingness to learn from our colleagues and the nonprofits that we're working with in China. I think, uh, thank you very much, all of you for your comments and I'll, I'll take the and thank you Francis for all the work you did on this and for your presentation um, just a, a last comment on the last topic um, you know humanitarian and disaster relief has been an area that the US people and the US government has excelled in for a long time we are a, a generous country and we're a capable country when it comes to this particular asset and you know, that's, that's both a humanitarian good, but it's also a geopolitical good. It has, it has been to our benefit as a country and our reputational advantage worldwide, that this is an aspect of both our population and our government. Um, it, so from that perspective, I think it's an important part of who we are going forward. As for China, they're not, it's not lost on them that those things are true. Um, and if we think we're in a great power competition, the way I look at it is it's not just about the military and the force of arms, it's about everything. And uh, it would be wonderful if we were competing to provide aid. Um, as for cooperation, we better hope we can cooperate because the current crisis and now the compounding one that Aaron and Joe and Aaron and everyone laid out that's coming soon 
um, is something that neither China nor the United States can address alone. So we better hope that we can work together and find a way to cooperate on this. And wouldn't it be nice if that also helps us get on a better path with each other? Um, so that's my final word, my answer. Thank you all for the work that you do in this space. It's really important on climate change, on disasters, and on figuring out what COVID means for all of that. Um, you're all important leaders in this field and we really appreciate your time and your words today. And for everyone who joined us, thank you very much and stay safe.